Okay, so I want to start today uh, by talking a little bit about uh, the midterm paper, which is actually going to be due slightly after midterm, so it's not going to factor into your midterm grade. Your midterm grade is going to be based on the response papers that you've done, uh, plus your participation, which for pretty much all of you has been, uh, has been fine. Um, so, you know, nobody is any, in any real trouble in this course. The big thing that we're going to want to be, the, the big element of your grade that is really going to be kind of most important anyway is going to be the big research paper that you'll do on, your, on the topic of your own choice over the course of the entire second half of the semester, right? So we're going to be transitioning into that starting the week after next. But because the draft of paper one is due a week from today, I figured it would behoove us to go over the requirements for that assignment. Uh, by the way, as far as what you did on the discussion boards was concerned, um, I am going, we are going to do something with that, right? It wasn't just busy work, um, but it was so damn loud in the building that it was just kind of too distracting to have um, a decent class, so um, I figured I would just have you do something um, at home, out of class. So yeah, you will be hearing from me about those on the discussion boards, and I would like you guys to be reviewing each other's uh, work there as well. Okay, so in terms of what is expected for paper one. So you're going to make a 1,000 to 1,500 word intervention. Oh, I should have put, put the word word in there. Um, intervention into one of the debates in the field of English studies we've looked at over the past several weeks, right? So issues of English and identity studies, um, Shakespeare requirements, uh, canon construction, things of that nature, right? Extrinsic versus intrinsic approaches to studying literature. You're going to choose one of those topics and you're going to make an argument about it, right? You are going to take a position and you're going to defend it using evidence from at least three sources that we've discussed in class. You can use the regular textbook as a source and you know, use two other sources that I've given you on Georgia View. One thing you might want to consider doing is expanding on one of your reflection papers from earlier in the term, right? You know, if you, if you had a particular reflection paper that you thought you did well on, you enjoyed the, the, the topic, you might want to stick with that and build on it. Um, we're going to do the assignment in two stages. The first is going to be a draft, and the second is going to be the final paper. So the draft is due a week from today. The final paper is due a week from Monday. And I do give extra credit if you go to the Writing Center, right? So go to the Writing Center, they send me back the requisite email, and um, you get half a letter grade extra credit. So the purpose of this first is to demonstrate knowledge of key issues and controversies in the field of English studies, to sharpen your argumentative skills by taking a position in a scholarly debate, and to use evidence to support a thesis, right? So remember that the taking a position part of this is key, right? Do not be wishy-washy. You have to come down on a particular side. There will be more than two sides in any given issue, right? But you have to come down on a particular side. All right, basic formal requirements are the usual, right? So it's gotta be Times New Roman font, 12 point type. Double space your submi uh, all submissions and make citations of your primary source in standard MLA format with parenthetical citations for in-text citations, right? And if you need citation data for your sources uh, that are taken from Georgia View, just ask me and I'll give, it, I'll give that to you. Um, any questions so far? Okay, if at any point you have questions, do feel free to stop me and ask. Uh, so the draft, that you're putting together for next week has to be at least 75% of the total required length in order to receive full credit. So 750 words for this assignment, right? So a little bit longer than one of yours than an average response paper. Um, and by full credit, I do mean full credit, right? Basically, if you do the draft and it's long enough and it is not plagiarized, then you get full points for it. You will then, like the final paper will itself then be judged on quality. Otherwise, the draft should represent your best attempt at responding to the assignment before receiving feedback from me. 
So behave as though you are putting together a final paper, and then you will probably have less to do when it comes to the revision stage, right? So keep the following in mind here. First, as I said, you must take a position, right? You have to have an argument. You can't just say there are pros and cons to X and Y, right? You can't say that, you know, there are many different opinions on X and Y, right? You have to come up with your own take on this and argue a position. Also remember that there are going to be more than two possible positions on any given issue, right? So <clears throat> make sure that you address a variety of possible objections to your argument, right? Because there's going to be more than one. Also, remember to quote your sources directly in order to analyze. Right now, I don't think most of you will have a problem with this. I mean, like this is the norm in the humanities generally, right? We quote rather than paraphrasing or summarizing. But remember that what you're doing is quoting in order to analyze, right? You're not necessarily just quoting to plug in evidence or because you wholeheartedly agree with something that one of your sources says, right? I want you actually trying to pick apart some of the language that they use and the assumption they make, right? And actually inserting the quote into the paragraph makes that easier to do, right? You're actually looking at the thing that you're working on. It also makes it easier for me to see where you're getting your interpretation from, right? And always remember that you have to explain to your reader why the quote means what you think it means, right? Provide that vital connective tissue there. Um, let's see, okay, when, and when you quote, make sure you set up the quote for your reader and then explain how it advances your argument. So follow, a stru I've given you a stru like a basic structure you can adapt and follow here, right? You know, so for example, in Culture and Anarchy, Matthew Arnold defines culture as something more than a set of artistic, political, or ritual practices, right? So you know that you're about to quote, who, you're, who and what you're quoting, and what the gist of the quote is, right? Then you quote, and then you explain the quote and how it advances your argument, right? Any questions? Okay. So, <clears throat> more specific directions for the paper, right? As you are working on the paper itself um, on top of the draft, right? So first, Pay attention to arrangement, right? You want to make sure the relationships between your paragraphs are clear and that each paragraph deals with only one main idea, right? Start each paragraph with a topic sentence that explains what you're about to talk about and that connects this paragraph to the last one, right? Make sure that each idea is connected to the one that came before it. Your thesis must be arguable. This means it must be supported by evidence. It must take a position on the question posed by the assignment. And that it must be an interpretation with which another reader could disagree, right? These are the three senses of the word arguable that are applicable to this assignment. And finally, particularly as you're writing your conclusion, you might want to think about the implications of your argument, right? So if your faction wins, or if the particular position you're arguing for wins the argument, what would be the implications for English studies as a discipline, right? How would this affect the development of, or the, you know, the discipline of the way it's taught or the way it's studied? And that's really about it here. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of this? Yeah, Keith. Just make an appointment with another tutor. Okay. Yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't be your own tutor. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, um, if, yeah, if you make an appointment with another tutor and uh, go, over the, go over your work with them, you'll get extra credit just like anyone else would. Okay. Any other questions? Everybody more or less clear on what you need to do. OK, if you do have questions, Please do feel free to email me. Um, I'm also willing to look at pre-draft drafts, right? So if you want me to look at something while you're working before you turn it in, um, at any stage, I'm happy to do that for you. 
Um, yeah, all right, so let's just uh, move along then. So right, the draft itself is due on the 12th, that's next Monday, and the final version of the paper is gonna be due on the 18th, so two weeks from today. Okay, so the question that we want to consider today is why are humanities subjects especially English and history so politically contentious Right, we rarely see political authorities meddling in the math curriculum, right? We do see them sometimes meddling in the curricula of, say, biology and geology for religious reasons, right? But I want you to just take a few minutes and think about what it is about English and history that makes these particular disciplines the subject of political debate, you know, of, of a political divide, right? Why do politicians like to meddle in these particular disciplines? So take maybe 10 minutes and see what you can come up with. Yeah, Nick. Um, while we're on that subject, isn't there something going on with the president trying to get rid of certain texts in high school curriculum? Yes, he is, this actually has to do with history curricula. And um, in particular, he is trumpeting what has become a popular talking point among conservatives. And there's a particular book uh, called A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn that should be banned from high school curricula. Um, now, what Zinn's book does is looks at the history of the United States not from the point of view of elites, as most uh, history texts tend to do, but instead kind of from the bottom up, right? It looks uh, at his American history from the viewpoint of marginalized communities and of the working classes and of the ordinary citizen. So this in and of itself has become contentious because it questions the usual narrative, right? Um, so yeah, that, that is actually a good, and, you know, to be clear also, the president doesn't actually have the power to do that. Um, those kinds of decisions are made by state and local school boards. Uh, but I think, yeah, you actually, you raise a good, this is a good example of the kind of thing that we're talking about, right? So yeah, just take about 10 minutes and think about why these sub, why you think these subjects inspire these kinds of debates and these kinds of battles. Why does it matter to the president what history textbooks, for example, are used in high school classes? Or what, what books you read in English class?
it looks like most of you have, been, at the very least, paused right now. Um, what have you been able to come up with? What do you think? It has to do with um, the politics that are involved in, the, in what people are learning. Mm -hmm. That has to do with who's at top or who is deciding what is being learned in the communities, especially okay. English. Okay, yeah, so a lot of it has to do with power, right? And claiming authority over what students are taught in school does confer an awful lot of power, right? So there is a lot at stake here, right? So why is it, why do you think specifically those, these disciplines? What do you get when you have power over these particular disciplines? Okay, well, you, um, you, 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 could, you could say the same by, say, like emphasizing math or science, too, right? What's unique about humanities disciplines and the way we interact with them? Okay, yeah, they're subjective for one thing, right? Good, so why would that matter, Sabrina? Yeah, a math problem basically does have one right answer, right? There might be multiple different ways of getting there, but there is going to be one correct answer. Um, this isn't really the case when you're looking at, you know, something you have to interpret, like a literary text or a historical event, right? Um, people can come to wildly different conclusions about these things based on their own backgrounds and experiences, right? Plus, you know, their own prior education. So yeah, so the fact that these are subjective, right? There is no... one right answer or one correct approach. Makes them a little bit frightening to existing power structures, right? So if you control the texts from which people are, are, are learning, right, that's one way to control the approach, right, and to prevent certain ideas from getting out. So what is it that the people who want power over this curriculum really want? Right, this isn't an end in itself. Why do we form canons in the first place? Gener uh, generalized how? Generalized as in it has the values of the people who created the canon. Okay, yeah, good. So yeah, we, we think of something like a canon, yeah, as a kind of crystallization of a set of values, right? And those values might be aesthetic, they might be moral, they might be religious or political, right? But they all kind of fall under this broader rubric of what we call culture, right? And the definition that we're going to be using of culture um, is pretty close um, to the one that Raymond Williams settles on in the introduction uh, to keywords. Right? So we're going to be referring to culture here as a shared way of life. That incorporates these other elements, right? So art is part of culture, 
politics is part of culture, religion is part of culture, right? And the purpose of culture is much like the purpose of a canon, right? So a canon also lends a sense of coherence, right? To a set of disparate ideas, right? So you've got all these texts that are composed by different writers in different places at different times, right? Not all of these writers are in direct dialogue with each other's works, right? You're not even, they're, they're not all <coughs> considering, you know, what has come before them or, you know, considering themselves as part of a tradition, right? Their tradition is assembled afterwards as a kind of back formation, right? So we have this body of texts that we are going to use as the foundation for our particular set of cultural values, right? So we are going to interpret these texts in a way that lends coherence to our view of the world. And so what a lot of this is about, what a lot of this power seeking here is about, is about promoting a unified worldview, right? And I'm trying to put that in the nicest and most politically neutral way that I can, right? So then, if you can control the humanities curriculum, particularly at the grade school and high school levels, what are you then able to control or to determine? The coherence of the people entering the world, how they're, how they interact with each other, how they. Yeah, exactly. You're, what, essentially, what you're doing is controlling how people get acculturated, right? How they become initiated into your particular culture, and how we're taught to interpret whatever texts we, uh, our culture considers valuable, right? So <clears throat> when we talk about value here as well, um, it's actually kind of a fortuitous coincidence that last week was Banned Books Week. Now, some of you may have seen uh, images floating around social media like this one, right? What do we have here? Yeah, a lot of the, yeah, the, these, yeah, most of these are books that are key parts of the high school or college curriculum, right? You know, all um, things that we regard as part of the Anglo-American canon, right? We got Mark Twain, we got Zora Neale Hurston, we got Kurt Vonnegut, J.D. Salinger, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Aldous Huxley, James Joyce, George Orwell. Um, why have these books piled up like this been circulating around? Remember the context of Banned Books Week. What claim is often being made about these books at this time of year? This hasn't trickled down yet, huh? Okay, so you will often see piles of books like this, usually arranged in a stack of 10. Sometimes the contents are slightly different. Sometimes you'll see To Kill a Mockingbird in here. Sometimes you'll see um, Animal Farm and 1984. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you'll see Slaughterhouse Five instead of Cat's Cradle, right? But the basic idea is always the same, right? What they're saying is that these are the 10 books that are most frequently banned or challenged in American public and school libraries. It's not true. These are books that were frequently challenged or banned 50 years ago. 
and usually not for the reasons people are now claiming that they were banned, right? For example, people now claim that Huckleberry Finn is banned or challenged uh, for frequent use of the N-word, right? Particularly in the name of one of the characters. When Huckleberry Finn was frequently being challenged or banned, that wasn't the reason people were giving it all. The reason they were giving for banning it was because it challenged received views about racial hierarchies in the United States in depicting that character as a human being with thoughts and feelings um, whom Huck values as a friend. Similar issues with Zora Neale Hurston. Um, the Catcher in the Rye was frequently banned uh, because um, of anti-authoritarian attitudes and also for a scene in which it's implied that Holden Caulfield's teacher tries to seduce him. Animal Farm, 1984, were weirdly questioned for promoting communism just by getting people thinking about communism, right? So <clears throat> this isn't the political correctness police coming to town and shutting down literary classics because of a couple of words that frankly are offensive, right? What this was was authority structures in place in the mid 20th century trying to control the curriculum in order to inculcate a particular attitude towards authority, right? And that's you know, an important thing to remember here, that a lot of this is about like, control of the canon and control of the historical narrative are about control of what our common culture is all about, right? So you'll remember maybe from a couple weeks ago when we talked about E.D. Hirsch, and his idea of cultural literacy. What do you remember about Hirsch on cultural literacy? What was he what was his complaint? What was he what was he concerned about? What did he argue that American students needed? Yeah, um, why in particular? So Hirsch was actually making this argument from the political left, right? Why did, why did Hirsch think we needed a traditional canon? What, was, what, was that, what would that canon be a part of? that Hirsch was bemoaning was the lack of a common culture and of a kind of common language for talking about that culture, right? It bothered him that students in the 80s were no longer recognizing uh, Shakespeare references and things like that, right? Even though, you know, we, we can see now that, you know, the fact that Shakespeare plays still get made into, you know, movie adaptations, right? We still recognize usually the Shakespeare structure underneath it, right? So, most of us know, right, that The Lion King, for example, is basically an adaptation of Hamlet, right? If you didn't know that, now you do. But, you know, we still we recognize that story, or we recognize that particular plot device. So when Hirsch was concerned that American students had no common store
of experience or culture, right? That we had no common cultural language anymore. And that what this meant, what this would inevitably lead to, was a kind of fragmentation of national communal identity. Right, that if we had no common agreed upon cultural inheritance, then we would have no sense of ourselves as a nation, right? So what is maybe the unintended implication of this? What is a nation? Yeah, although, you know, one could argue that, at least to a certain extent, Americans and Canadians, or Canadians and Britons, or Brits and Americans share at the very least a similar culture, right? You know, people talk broadly about European culture as well, right? So, <clears throat> is a common culture a common culture is part of it, right? I think it's the, kind of like the basic building block here. But I think that what is really necessary from this particular viewpoint take from the work of Benedict uh, Anderson uh, from his book Imagined Communities. So Anderson argues that a nation is always an imaginary construct. couple of levels. We think of the United States as a nation, right? But <clears throat> given the wide geographical expanse it covers and the sheer numbers of people who live here, how likely is it that any of you will ever forge a personal connection with every other American? Impossible, right? Even in a relatively small nation, like, you know, say Ireland, right? It's impossible to know everybody. You know, you're talking about, you know, even there, like a population of something like five million people, right? So, what Anderson is arguing is in order to think of ourselves as having some kind of common goal or common identity with other people, we have to be able to imagine that they are like us in some way, right? We have to be able to imagine that we are all similar enough, that we all share enough, that we subordinate our personal or family or communal, communal identities, communi community identities, to some kind of larger idea, right? And this is largely produced by agreement on a common cultural heritage. A 
and I use the word cultural, I use the words cultural heritage here specifically because we are talking about art and about history, right? We're talking about a way of life that is at least regarded as having been inherited from past generations, right? Hence the word heritage. But by and large, this cultural heritage is also imaginary. If, for example, um, we look at a place uh, like, um, you know, a country like um, <clears throat> Vietnam, right? The emergence of Vietnam as a nation, and I, I focus on Vietnam because Benedict Anderson's specialty was actually Southeast Asia. Um, the emergence of Vietnam as an independent state is a reaction against its subjection by first other larger regional powers and then by the French. And then its attempted subjection by the United States in the 50s through the early 70s, right? So, <clears throat> While there is, historically, a place called Vietnam with a common culture and common boundaries, right, there was no nation in place until the 20th century. We can see similar situations in a lot of post-colonial um, African nations, right, where you, or African countries, I should say, right, where you have a variety of different nations um, you know, for example, if we look at Nigeria, you have a Yoruba nation, an Igbo nation, a Hausa nation, a Fulani nation. You have all these different ethnic groups that control their own territory. And the shape of their nation when the British leave is determined by what the boundaries of British territory were there, right? This is the part that was controlled by Britain. That becomes Nigeria. This is the part that was controlled by France. That becomes someplace else, right? So <clears throat> what a lot of these countries end up having to do is reaching back to some imagined past to find some kind of common narrative, right? And this is the root of, this is the root of what we call post-colonial theory. Right, the attempt to figure out how to create a nation out of the wreckage of an imperial system, right? How do we come up with a common identity as Nigerians when before we had been Yoruba and Igbo and Hausa, right? How do we come up with a common identity as Americans when we had been English, French, Spanish, and finally, once they are included as citizens, West African, right? <clears throat> How do we forge a common identity as a nation? And unfortunately, a lot of this comes down to the exercise of power, right? So, as you are no doubt aware, there has been a lot of discussion about monuments over uh, the last several years, right? And this is actually part of a related conversation, right? This is not something that is distinct from say, the idea of the canon or the idea of school curricula. So when we talk about monuments, right, what is a monument? Something made to remember something. 
Yeah, it's uh, an object of commemoration, right? So, if we build a monument to a person or to an event, right? What is that suggesting about that person or event or whatever? Yeah, that it's, that it's culturally important, right? That it's important enough to be worth remembering. And we often construct these kinds of um, historical back formations to justify monuments when they have become problematic in contemporary culture, right? So we often divorce them from the original contexts in which they were built in order to justify keeping them up. So to give you an example of this, uh, one of the most frequently memorialized figures in the United States is Christopher Columbus. Right? There are Columbus statues all over the damn place. Even in places, like, really, like Columbus never came to the American mainland anyway. Um, all of his voyages were to the West Indies. There's no particularly good reason, right, for there to be a Christopher Columbus statue in Minneapolis regardless, right? Certainly never went that far inland. So why are there so many damn Christopher Columbus statues all over the place? It was considered something culturally important to remember. Okay, yeah. He's considered a universal enough figure, at least for a time, right, that all of these statues start going up. So let's look at when these statues start going up. And the holiday the origins of the holiday that's associated with Columbus as well, right? So a lot of the first monuments and the first celebration of the holiday go up 1892. Now there's a highly specific historical reason for this. In that year, 11 Italian immigrants were lynched in New Orleans. And the national government, as a gesture of peace and welcoming and integration to Italian-Americans and to try to um, ease tensions with the Italian embassy, instituted Columbus Day and started the construction of Columbus statues across the United States. Now, in the 1930s, Italian-American organizations like the Knights of Columbus were continually petitioning the federal government for permanent recognition of Columbus Day. And again, for more memorialization of their sort of key cultural figure, right? So Columbus becomes a figure of Italian-Americans increasing integration into mainstream American society, right? as they cease to be regarded as an alien or immigrant community and become part of the regular fabric of the nation. Now then, we start thinking about how Columbus's legacy becomes problematic, right? What's problematic about Columbus? Do you guys know enough about the history here to know what, what people regard as problematic about Columbus? Yes. Not only that, um, when he was governor of the West Indian colonies that he had discovered, um, his regime was particularly brutal. Um, and indeed, he's largely responsible for at least beginning the process of exterminating the native peoples of the West Indies, right? 
So Columbus is a name that at one point is associated with Italian American pride, and later, as people delve deeper into the history, becomes more closely associated with genocide, right? And so then the question remains, right? Are the historical circumstances that led to the building of all these monuments still relevant, right? Are the historical circumstances that led to the building of these Columbus statues important enough to continue to remember a figure whose legacy is in so many ways so reprehensible? And we see similar issues, right, um, in England uh, only this year. This is a statue of one of the 18th century city fathers that's kind of leading citizens of the port city of Bristol. And eventually, this will get called up. So this is a guy named Edward Colston, once you can see it. Now, does this name sound familiar for, for any of you who follow the news? Do any of you know what happened to Colston's statue this year? Okay, it ended up getting tossed in the harbor. Right? A group of activists took the statue down on their own and threw it into Bristol's harbor. Because while Colston is commemorated in the community for his various philanthropic efforts, he made most of his fortune as a slave trader. So the money he was using to benefit the city of Bristol was made in the slave trade, right? So historical reassessment of this figure leads people to regard him as more, more problematic than worthy of commemoration, right? And that's the basic idea that is at work when we talk about cultural heritage and canon revision here, right? That the fact that one set of value, that, or that one group of people controls the narrative at any given time, right? does not mean they will control the narrative forever. But if you want your particular group's interests to be promoted within the wider culture, right, then you have to have some control over this wider curriculum. So English and history in particular become the site of these powerful struggles over identity, right? And whether it's more important to forge, say, a common identity as Americans or as Britons or as Canadians or what have you, right? Or whether it is more important to pursue um, a multicultural program and to allow, in particular, like the, the development of these sort of more kind of these smaller identitarian groups, right? Um, who have often traditionally been excluded from or relegated to the sides in the broader monoculture, right? The larger culture that Hirsch was talking about. And so in the 1960s, we have um, an explosion in what comes to be called identity theory. Post-colonial theory is one version of this, right? But we see a growth in feminist readings, first of traditional texts, and then um, sort of excavation of the historical record to discover forgotten women writers, right? You see the same thing happening in African American criticism. 
right? Queer theory is also a product of this particular era, right? And in fact, when we talk of going back to the whole banned books thing, um, the actual 10 most frequently banned books, you can actually check this up uh, in the library. They had a table out. Um, I think they may have taken it down. It was up at, at least until last Friday. They had a table that listed the 10 most frequently banned books from school libraries today. All of them dealt with um, LGBTQ plus issues, except for the Harry Potter series, uh, because which, which was banned because witches. Um, but yeah, so <clears throat> many of the opponents of the traditional canon are coming from these identity theory positions, right? And are often constructing counter canons that <clears throat> are sometimes in dialogue with the larger canon, but are often kind of sealed off from it as well, right? Um, so, you know, there, there are canons now of women's right. In fact, like, if there's a Norton anthology of something, you can say that, that there, there is a canon of a particular branch of literature, right? Um, there was um, a large effort in Ireland in the 1980s to create a kind of Ir a specifically Irish canon in opposition to British dominance of Irish culture. It's called the, the Field Day, uh, was the Field Day Book of Irish Literature. Um, and it's five volumes and it's enormous. And it hurts to check it out of the library. Um, because they're very, very heavy. And a lot of the writing in it is direct, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, uh, so where to go with this? Um, the basic idea here, right? So we talked about this difference between extrinsic and intrinsic approaches. Literature, right? So where the extrinsic is concerned with things outside the text itself, right? And the intrinsic is concerned only with the text itself. Now, most intrinsic readings of any given text would argue that <clears throat> art is in some way above or unconcerned with politics, right? But I think we noted in a previous session that that isn't in and of itself a political position, right? An extrinsic critic would argue that it's impossible to avoid politics in your discussion of any cultural artifacts, right? Even if all you were talking about is aesthetic value, because even those aesthetic values come from a particular subjective place, right? Your aesthetic values come from your particular set of experiences, which are conditioned in some way by your social and socioeconomic class and education. So there's really kind of no way to get around the idea that humanities disciplines are inherently political, right? More so than the hard sciences or mathematics in large part because they are very much caught up in the notion of promoting a particular worldview, right? What we get when we study literature and history, we get how specific humans in specific times, conditioned by particular circumstances, process the world around them, right? Into narrative. And <clears throat> unpacking that narrative can't help but be in some way a political act. It doesn't have to be, you know, a leftist act. It can be, you know, there are, you know, right-wing and conservative interpretations as well, right? You know, as we see, particularly in these kinds of attempts to, these to it's just the kind of jockeying back and forth to see who controls school curricula, right? But we can't reasonably say that politics isn't a, can, that politics is can be excluded from consideration of study in the humanities. 
So, does anybody have any questions about any of this? So we're going to be looking, so uh, we're going to be continuing along the kind of post-colonial route here. We're going to be looking at how language and literary study relate to identity in specifically post-colonial cultures um, next time. You're going to be looking at a piece by Salman Rushdie, a piece by the Kenyan writer Gugi Watongo, and also a piece by the West Indian writer Kamau Braithwaite. Um, and yeah, that's where we go from here. So if you have questions about the draft, uh, please do shoot me an email. Um, otherwise, we'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>